it's hard to believe how much the world has changed since we originally uh, set this uh, panel discussion and even in our uh, more recent discussions about it. But what hasn't changed is um, the vital role that philanthropy has to play um, in the United States um, and in the Jewish community uh, in particular. Um, I think the moment we're in uh, reminds us of um, the imperative of really being um, thoughtful practitioners um, and the imperative of understanding um, the role that philanthropists and funders um, play in, in social society um, uh, in the United States. Uh, th this particular session came out of a larger set of questions um, and a larger process, uh, which we call ARC now, uh, Applied uh, Research in, in Jewish Community, um, which is led by uh, Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, who I'm going to introduce um, momentarily. Um, and the idea of ARC was all of us as funders spend a lot of time trying to figure out um, how we can make a difference in our communities, how we can make a difference with our grantees and how we can help. And uh, I think the organizations we support spend a lot of time thinking about um, how they can do better, um, how they can maximize their potential. What we're not giving enough energy and thought into um, is what is this field going to look like 10 years from now? Uh, what are we trying to um, accomplish as a Jewish community? What are the trends that we could be um, expecting, but not just as an analysis, but as policy recommendations? Given where we think the world is going in the next 10 years, what ought we be doing differently? As funders, what ought we be doing differently? As heads of not-for-profits, what ought we be doing differently as um, Jewish leaders? And that was the, the idea of, um, of ARC, uh, to look at a set of questions with some really smart um, uh, academics and practitioners um, and make specific policy recommendations to the funding community and to uh, policymakers um, in the Jewish community. Uh, we want to use today's time together to give you an inkling into one of those questions, uh, which is uh, pertinent to everyone on the phone, because it's how do we think about our own grant making and whether it should be democratized? Um, how would we do that? Is there a benefit to it? Um, and are the risks associated outweighed by the benefits? Um, so that's what today's discussion is going to be about. Um, we look forward to your questions um, and uh, input into it. Um, ARC is um, a project of our foundation, along with the uh, Schusterman Foundation, the Jim Joseph Foundation, and the Marcus Foundation. And as I said, is ably run and led by uh, Yehuda Sarna, Rabbi Yehuda Sarna of uh, the Bronfman Center at NYU. Um, and I think the highest role a moderator can play is to get out of the way, which I am doing now and handing this over to you. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And um, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you all, even albeit virtually. And of course, even as we're engaging this conversation, you know, our hearts and minds are with all those who are, um, who are really, you know, confronting this, uh, the coronavirus head on. And, um, but the, uh, and the role that we're playing in the, in the role of communal leadership and philanthropy is, is essential, be essential going forward. Now, let me just say a word about the process uh, which Mark referenced and what the Applied Research Collective is. And then I'll go to interviewing uh, Lila Corn Berman, who's one of our star fellows uh, from, from uh, the first cohort. Uh, the idea was to try to surface the key questions, not the ones that, it, that with a one or two year horizon, but really ones which, which are generational, you know, the next 10 years, the next 20 years. Um, and to invite in scholars who, um, who have a unique perspectives and are distinguished in their own fields, and at the same time are not always in the, in the uh, kind of center of Jewish communal conversations. Um, what we did was, and I think what made this process unique, is that we had five 
scholars from the academy as well as five practitioners as part of one cohort. And we would meet monthly, enabling each person to just surface a question which uh, felt to them like a real question, something that they knew a lot about, but also something they didn't already know the answer to. And then within the context of this group, through the both the interdisciplinary, that is the different scholars who are at the table, as well as the mix of theory and reality, you know, the practitioners who are also at the table, and enabling everybody to deepen their question um, and then pursue a unique course of research. Um, the initial publications from last year are already online. I'll share the links with everybody um, uh, towards the end of the session. And for today, um, I'm going to be interviewing Lila Corin Berman, who actually has been studying Jewish philanthropy, uh, has been writing about Jewish philanthropy, is coming out with a book soon about Jewish philanthropy. And Lila, I was just wondering um, if we could begin with you sharing a little bit about what brought you to the study of Jewish philanthropy. You know, what is it in your background, in your childhood? Why, why is this, has this become an area of passion for you? Sure. Um, I just want to say thank you, Mark and Yehuda and um, all of the staff at the Jewish Funders Network um, for pivoting to um, this really difficult moment and still recognizing that it's important to have these kinds of conversations, even as it's important to recognize, as uh, Yehuda said, that there are people who can't right now be having these conversations and there's so many resources that necessarily have to be directed now to, to a real crisis. Um, and so um, I am so pleased to be here and um, to be able to have this conversation. And I think it has to be said that the way that I'm gonna talk about what I'm talking about today, and I would imagine a certain different level of maybe passion even than, um, than I had before is influenced by the very present today. Um, and the sense that something has gone very awry with how our resources are distributed in our society. Um, and actually that is the starting place for how I'll briefly answer your question, Yehuda. Um, I didn't get my training thinking I was always gonna write about philanthropy. I've written two other books that are not about Jewish philanthropy, um, but I know that as a child, um, I was raised in a pretty middle-class home um, with two parents who were very well educated um, and who made decisions to work in the public sector, who were members of unions, a public school teacher, and a psychologist who worked in the uh, New York State mental health system. And uh, we talked about money a lot. Um, and my parents were certainly very intent on making us understand that so many of the ways that money was used in the world around us were harming people and were harming our environment. And in, as a child, it was not always pleasant to be reminded of this constantly when one mainly wanted to go to the mall or go shopping or do the things that, you know, teenager growing up in Poughkeepsie, New York wanted to do. Um, but it was always really clear to me that, that for my parents, the answer to the problems with wealth inequality, which frankly were not as profound as they are now, um, was not for individuals just to make better decisions. It wasn't just to write a bigger check or to stretch yourself beyond what you maybe thought was safe to, to you know, give more money. Um, and it wasn't just to be involved in sort of the civil society of charity or of tzedakah, although that mattered but that there were these big structures that, um, that made it so that those kinds of individual solutions were actually not enough and were sometimes harmful. Um, and I remember my parents talking about paying taxes. Um, and I don't know if I talked to my kids enough about taxes. I, you know, I should. Um, but in talking about why it was important and what this meant, that this was not about an individual giving a charitable donation that this was about being part of a different kind of social contract and that big structures needed to change in order for more people to have access to wealth. That the problem was not that there was not enough wealth, but the problem was that it was um, accumulating in certain places to the benefit of a very few and to the detriment of lots and lots of people whose needs were not met. 
Um, and so when my research took a turn to thinking about Jewish philanthropy, and I can talk about or not talk about now why that happened and when that happened, all of those conversations from when I was a child, many of which I had only half listened to, if at all, uh, sort of came back to me that, that there had been this sense that um, unlike some of the other families that I knew with the way that doing good and wealth was talked about, was talk it was talked about through the frame just of, of charitable giving, um, that I had grown up with this different sense of what um, the responsibility of not just individuals, but of a society, of a public really was. Through the paper that you published through the Applied Research Collective, Lila, um, you talk about the conflict between, between democracy and philanthropy. And, and frankly, when we began talking about that, I had never thought about those two things as a conflict. I thought about philanthropy only as enhancing democracy. Can you speak to a little bit what you see as the tension between those two? Absolutely. And I think that tension is the right word, right? Because it's not clear that philanthropy is the best thing for democracy, and it's not clear that philanthropy is an impediment to democracy, right? So there's almost like you could imagine two competing narratives about the relationship between philanthropy and democracy and whether or not philanthropy extends or limits democracy. Um, and in one, we can imagine, and this is how thinkers in the 19th century like de Tocqueville and others who were writing about private philanthropic associations talked about it, that, that philanthropy really nourishes democracy, um, that it can revitalize democratic institutions, it can strengthen a sense of civic education, it can amplify the voices of the underrepresented, that the problem in a sense with democracy is it can flatten a lot of the differences, a lot of the um, you know, collective loyalties that people have and the sense of passion that somebody has to do something that's not necessarily going to capture the attention of the majority, right? Tocqueville talked about um, associational life, by which he meant philanthropy as really being um, a, a form of self-interest best understood, right? That, that this really actually kind of enhances democracy by filling in some of the gaps of a system that really, you know, could flatten those more collective or individualized based ideas and systems. Um, and, and that this was how people could come to feel connected to communities and thereby connected to a larger kind of civil society. But there's another narrative. And I think that the problem is that in my historical research, it seems that this other poll has sort of been pulling um, a little bit stronger than the first one I described. And in this one, philanthropy really is capable of eroding democracy. It can eclipse government as the guardian of the public good. Um, it can impose elite priorities and deepen economic divides. Um, and it can do so not just because, or sometimes not even because, of malicious, intense, or nefarious visions of some kind of elite group. It can do so because of the way that the structure works, right? Because it works only when you have people who are um, able to amass a certain level of capital and who thereby are making decisions according to the very structure, legal system of American philanthropy, making systems on behalf of the, making decisions on behalf of the public good, in fact, subsidized by the public dollar without the voices of the public actually involved in those decisions. So, and that runs quant contrary to democracy. So, so what would it look like? I mean, you talk a little bit about participatory grant making. What, what would be entailed in, in, in um, mitigating or kind of protecting against um, the, uh, a, 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 um, the suppression of democracy by philanthropic vehicles? Um, is there a way to integrate more of a uh, democratic ethos into uh, at least uh, not talking about American philanthropy writ large, but even just within our community, within the scope of a foundation or federation or even an individual giver, uh, what kind of mechanisms could be, um, could be included? Um, so I have, I have a plan for that, Yehuda. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I think that we need to think about that question on four levels. Um, and I think the first is to start with a kind of value proposition. Um, and I know that it's not always easy to get full buy-in on a value proposition, but I wanna put this out there. 
um, which is that I think that the institutions and leaders that constitute American Jewish philanthropy, in fact, have a vested interest and a very particular interest, I would say, in safeguarding a healthy democracy that works for the vast majority of Americans. And that demands that we make a value judgment, that in fact, that is the case, that American Jews specifically and their philanthropic institutions have a vested interest in the extension of democracy for the most Americans. And I think that it's evident from almost daily headlines, although our headlines have been changing, of course, lately, that as more Americans feel, um, feel disenfranchised or powerless within the American political and economic system, that they turn to alternatives that can be deeply and even violently harmful to minorities, to freedoms and to liberal ideals. And that I think that philanthropy that amasses private resources and public benefits and then skirts the process of public consent can fuel resentments and it can diminish the chances that people will actually seek recourse through democracy and its, its institutions. So I could talk more about that, but I think that as a first principle, we would have to have buy into that value proposition. That in fact, it behooves um, our communal institutions to be invested in democracy for reasons that are particular to our safety and our security. No, Lila, if I, if I could just say, it does seem like we're in a bit of a democratic recession. You know, the number right. of countries in the world who vote for their leader now, there are fewer of them than there were 10 years ago. Um, and by, you know, every, you know, democratic inde de democracy indexes, mm -hmm. indices, uh, those appear, even countries which continue to be democracies are, are now right lower down on, the, on those indices. Um, and I think in part it's because people are asking their question, uh, is, democracies, is democracy really the best way to govern? But you, you, you believe very strongly that it, that, that it has to continue in that way. Yes, I do. All right, sorry for interrupting you. No, I, um, and, and, and we could talk more about that and why I believe that, why I believe that as a Jewish person, specifically why I believe it as a historian, um, why I think when we see the downward trend in that democracy index, we see the upward trend in forms of xenophobia and nativism and violence toward, toward people. Um, and so, so I, yeah, I mean, I think that, that protecting that is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and then to your specific question then of, well, what, what then would have to change to allow for this kind of embrace, right? If, if, if we agree on some kind of value proposition about democracy, and I have thought about it through the categories of knowledge, through the category of participation, and through spending behaviors. Um, and the one that we have talked most about is participation, right? So um, in sort of surveying the broader philanthropic world, I became really interested in this mode of grant making toward par called participatory grant making and um, working with a political scientist named Matt Berkman, who's at Oberlin now, we've done some studying of different ways that philanthropic institutions, and these are not Jewish ones, are embracing the ideals of democracy um, in a sense through creating a philanthropic process that itself is informed by the practices and values of democracy. That is, instead of treating philanthropy as sort of outside of a democratic process, right? Um, treating the very practices of it as something that the public, the community, the demos itself becomes the decision maker engine of the process. And there's a whole range of ways that participatory grant making can make can work. So there's like kind of the lowest level participatory grant making um, tends to be a model where donors, you could think of it as um, maybe giving circles, right, where donors themselves, instead of giving the money to some kind of institution that then has a, a system for making decisions on behalf of the whole, where donors have more of a voice. Um, but on a more um, robust sort of level, participatory grant making is really about not letting a kind of pay to play model um, you know, the same way that we try not to have pay to play when it comes to voting and to other forms of democracy in this country, but instead thinking about who are the communities 
that are being um, affected by this philanthropic institution or these philanthropic goals and bringing in those communities to themselves be involved in the process of allocation and decision making. Um, and so we have surveyed some really fascinating examples of how that works. Um, it is a, a totally different way of thinking about um, how philanthropy works. And it always has to sort of balance expertise with voices of lots of people from the community. But that's been, that's been one kind of node of this research. And I can talk more about that or I could talk about the knowledge and spending. Um, so now what would be the difference then between what uh, participatory grant making where it's, it's the people, I guess the beneficiaries mm -hmm. um, uh, who would, you know, who are involved in the decision making as opposed to, uh, is that the same as giving circles? Is that the same as federation commissions, which involve lay leaders or is it different? So um, there are some giving circles that are moving more and more toward what I would call a kind of participatory mode, where it's not simply that the people in the circle are people who've anteed up, right? Where a giving circle will say, um, we're really concerned about reproductive health in this community and um, high school age girls. And they will then go into that community and they will talk to, you know, girls and healthcare providers, and they will bring together a group of people to essentially constitute a board um, that will then work together, study the problem, and make decisions about allocation. So some of the people involved will, will have given the funds, and some will come with other kinds of knowledge, and some will be the people who are the public um, in whose name these efforts are happening, right? So, so there's models, I think, that can work within a giving circle. Um, there are other models where instead of a group of donors um, or professionals or experts or whoever it might be saying, okay, these are the problems we're going to work on. This is the agenda saying, okay, this is where we're located, right? So we're located in, you know, this part of Manhattan or we're, we're our interest is in this part of um, the world. And we don't know what the real problems are here really. We, you know, we might think we do, but first we need to engage with the people in this community and talk to them about what, you know, what are their lives like. So for example, I know in Ann Arbor, there's a wonderful community foundation there and they had some priorities that they thought were gonna help the people who were working class and struggling with certain issues of uh, economic insecurity in the area but they realized that they, they weren't actually talking to those people. And so they convened these community meetings and came up with an entirely different set of priorities based on that. Um, one of the prerequisites for this, I believe, is having a much more capacious view of who belongs at the table, right? And who the community is and who the stakeholders are. And so, you know, I think that in the Jewish context, it really would mean, um, opening up a sense of, you know, the, the politics, the identity politics, the geopolitics that, that can be spoken of as part of the kind of diversity of Jewish interests and how decisions are made about what happens to capital. And the last thing I'll say is that I think we see a lot of studies about how more and more Jews are giving to non-Jewish causes and that this is not Jewish philanthropy. But in fact, if we think about engaging a broader Jewish public in the philanthropic process, um, it might really mean understanding what that means and rethinking those lines that seem to be drawn periodically between what is appropriately Jewish philanthropy and what's not Jewish philanthropy. So let, let me ask you this question. Uh, let's say I'm uh, uh, um, an individual giver. Um, I, I'm hearing you speak and I want to, um, I'd like to integrate some of the principles that you're mentioning into my own philanthropic work. What do I do? So you're in a, what do you do? Let's say, no, no, let's say, okay, I have, uh, I, have um, I give away, let's say a uh, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars okay. a year. Right. Um, how can I, how can I integrate some of the, some of your, you know, there's a number of organizations I'm committed to. How can I integrate some of the uh, of the kind of ideas that you're presenting into my own giving? Right. 
So I think that the first thing that um, I would ask you to think about is how you make spending decisions when it comes to philanthropy. Um, what we know is that over the last, say, decade, but really probably we could trace it two decades would be fair, um, more and more philanthropic money instead of circulating goes into places with the kind of idea of a, of a longer time range of spending, right? So whether it's put into donor advised funds, um, supporting foundations, whatever these kinds of vehicles are that certainly do spend, but also that seem to have an interest in um, accumulating, right? And so the first thing I think I would ask is that you as a donor think about, um, you know, are you willing to actually make sure that the money that you are designating philanthropically is money that circulates, right? Because I think that that's also a kind of prerequisite for what I'm talking about. Um, I listened yesterday morning to a really fascinating session that I've now heard is going to be broadcast on the website. So if you don't have a chance, uh, if you didn't have a chance to, to be on yesterday, please listen on the website. And it was called Sadaka We Can Believe In, a $600 billion opportunity to secure the Jewish future. Um, and not to put too fine of a point on it, but that's kind of the exact opposite of what I'm talking about. Um, I, and again, it's not that I think the people proposing it are um, wrong or have an ill intention. I would in fact like to talk more to them about what it is exactly that they're trying to do with building this kind of huge endowment um, for a Jewish future out of a sense of fear that the values that they think of today as Jewish values might not exist in the future, right? And that's, that's basically language taken from their website. So that would be an example of somebody saying, you know, I have all of this philanthropic money and I need to kind of put it somewhere so that I can see that in the future things will be the way that I think they should be. So what I would say to a donor instead is first of all, think about prioritizing circulating your capital, right? So instead of putting it into funds that are going to sit or that are going to accumulate, um, think about first of all, the, the value of making sure that you're circulating your capital. Second of all, think about the kinds of places that you're interested in giving to and think about whether those places, so I, you know, to keep with the reproductive health, right? If it's Planned Parenthood or something, right? Think about whether or not you think that those places are engaging with a broad community and a broad public, right? And how they make their decisions. But I don't think what I'm talking about is so much for the individual donor as for the kind of system of foundations and federations, um, the, the broader system, if that makes sense. Well, look, if I could push back for a yeah. bit, you know, and, and to bring us to um, late March of 2020, um, organizations which um, used, utilized the opportunity of the, you know, the 11 year stretch of of, uh, a, a, a kind of a strong economy, strengthening economy, to prepare for rainy day, to either build an endowment, uh, create a uh, um, you know a, a, um, a, you know hold on to a surplus. Uh, in many ways, those are the ones now that are 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 going to survive. Um, organizations which are which were built, which had very high rate of cir circulating their money may fold because, because this is a tough month, next month is a tough month. Um, how, how do you reconcile that? So what I think our moment, and I actually went back to read some of, some of the minutes from the New York Jewish Federation um, during the Great Depression. And um, you know, it frankly made me emotional to read about the leaders in the 1930s who were saying, we're gonna go to the very, very bottom of our reserves. They're, we're gonna go, they called them reserves, surpluses. They didn't build endowments in the way that we do now. In fact, they were ideologically opposed to it, which I could talk about in another time. But they, they said, um, we're gonna spend out everything because we know that the community gave us this money and we know that there are people in need and there are people struggling and this is not the time to sit on anything. This is the time to 
circulate this money to people who are in need. And what's going to happen in the future? I don't know. Are we going to be around in the future? I don't know. Does that matter when there are people who are suffering? Not really. And to read the way that they were thinking about capital, and these were not socialists, right? These were not people, these were bankers. These were business people. These were radical, not, not what we would call radical people. And they said, simply as a matter of truth, that we do not sit on this money now. We circulate it. And we give it in the ways that we can give best. And we talk to people and we try to understand. And they were, you know, and, and I'm not saying these were all heroes, right? But in our moment, it is so powerful to think about that as an example, which is very, very different from trying to, to you know, imagine some future and saying that, you know, we, we actually really have to kind of hold on to this or else we'll be out of control in the future, right? And so what I would say is, yeah, there are organizations that are gonna to have to fold because of this and that's gonna be really bad and that's gonna be really sad. But I think it would be worse and sadder if the organizations that have stores of capital decide that this is the time to just keep, you know, kind of keep the locks on that capital, right? Because this is, this is absolutely a time when there is the need to, to open that up. Um, and, and, and to do everything in our power to circulate that capital so that people and, um, you know, systems don't fall apart. Uh, what would you recommend? Or what would you want to see now from, um, from foundations and federations? Um, so, I think that one of the pieces um, that would be important if there were an embrace of this more democratic mode of thinking about Jewish philanthropy um, would be to really grapple with this essential you know, issue of, is it, is it in the interest of Jewish philanthropy to continue to kind of draw a division between what is important for the Jewish community and what is important for the kind of larger public, the larger, you know, American and global public. And I think that the truth of the matter is that that, that line is always shifting, right? And I don't think we have to make some kind of hard, fast rule that, um, you know, and, and this was one of my responses to the $600 billion session, which is about designating money that's going to go to, to um, philanthropy to support Jewish causes in Israel. And I understand that the point is to kind of try to leave that open, exactly what that means. But I think that the bottom line is that there are times when the moment requires that Jewish communities that have the ability think about their Jewishness as, as serving um, well beyond any kind of definition of what is a, a Jewish organization or a Jewish community. And I think that there are moments when when that more internal looking um, form of, of fostering Jewish identity and, and you know, cultivating um, Jewish community can happen. And I think that we need to, in, in a sense, have a real nimbleness about that. And I think we are in a moment when um, we understand that just as the virus knows no partisan lines and just as it um, knows no lines of of ethnicity or of race or sexuality, it, those lines of who's Jewish and who's not Jewish, it doesn't matter, right? So this is a moment when it would be really instructive to say that Jewish philanthropy now has to be flowing to um, all of those places that can help people who are gonna be struggling because of the health consequences of the virus and because of the deep economic consequences of it. And that doesn't mean that then we're just giving up and that we'll never again will we be able to, you know, foster strong Jewish educational programs or Jewish identity-based programs, right? It means we're responding to the historical moment. Um, so that's what I would say today to, to keep that in mind, that these Mark, things can change. Mark, I, I'm curious um, if we can go back to you for a few minutes. 
um, from the perspective of someone who's been very involved in Jewish philanthropy, leads a foundation, just to get some of your reactions to some of the points that, that, uh, that Lila has been raising. So I, I, as Lila knows, because we've had a chance to discuss this, I'm both fascinated um, by this subject, but also troubled when it's taken to its, um, its extremes. Um, so I, I think that, um, firstly, uh, as my colleague Jonathan sent in, uh, Jonathan Horowitz sent in a question, uh, I think just from experience to say that um, consensus-based philanthropy is somehow more effective, um, I think that there is certainly a theoretical value in it, how that value plays out in the real world is not one that I've seen evidence of effectiveness. I don't think, for instance, you know, in the, the world of Jewish philanthropy, if you pit federations versus foundations, I, I certainly wouldn't make the argument that the, the democratic process guiding federations produces more effective result. I think there's a place for it. Um, but I think, Lila, I take your point as um, how critical today um, is for people to marshal their resources, but then part of our obligation is to marshal them as effectively as possible. And sometimes uh, values can be competing values. And the question is which value has to suffer in order to do um, the most good. And sometimes um, being able to be quick and responsive and entrepreneurial, um, I think uh, trumps, if we're allowed to still use that word, um, the value of, of consensus in democracy. That, that's number one. Number two is, um, I, I actually, the, the thing I like most about your, um, your work is its application in certain areas of saying, let's bring voices of the recipient or affected communities into the decision-making process. I actually think that's very smart. And I think that in areas, it makes a lot of sense. I know, practically speaking, there are lots of boards that I've sat on where you have the one or two um, recipients on the board. Um, and I, I, I don't find it makes for a, a higher quality of decision making. Um, they're not representative. They're not experts in the field. They're deeply knowledgeable about their own personal experience, which may or may not have anything to do with anyone else's personal experience. They don't have scope. Um, you know, it, it, there's, there's one thing bringing on someone who's an expert in the field as opposed to someone who kind of owns the resources to inform the discussion, but bringing in, um, you know, one patient into a clinical study and saying, now I'm basing my entire theories about the experience of this one patient, I think is bad medicine and bad science, and I'm afraid it's bad philanthropy as well. I think they are the right points to make when um, you are operating within the philanthropic system as it exists now, right? So the measures of efficacy as they exist in the system right now, you're absolutely correct, are not going to be met according to this more democratized process. Full stop, absolutely. So then the question becomes, do we believe that those measures of efficacy, if they run contrary to uh, certain fundamental values of democracy and of enabling a broader swath of the public to have a voice and to feel as if they are part of what is happening and the decisions that are being made vis-a-vis -vis philanthropy. Um, if those measures of efficacy do not achieve those kinds of measures, are they the right measures? Right? So I think that's one thing to, you know, and, and that then becomes at least a point of discussion, right? Because right, if, if we operate within the framework of efficacy as A, B, and C, and we could agree on, you know, on what they are in this framework, um, then there's no way in a million years that this kind of method is the right method, right? So, and I would say in a sense, 
to your second point about recipients serving on a board, um, it's a similar kind of answer, right? So absolutely bringing one or two kind of token voices of the recipients to sit on a board with people who are not like them, who people, with people who kind of have, have seats on that board because of the level of power they have, because of um, the, the power of the purse that they might be. And then, okay, you know, you speak and you sort of give the hexture that, that we're, you know, operating by caring about what you guys are saying. It's also not gonna work, right? It takes a different kind of model of organizing. Right, and probably changing the model of what a board is. Um, and, and this person I've been working with on this research, Matt Berkman, has, has just produced, and I'll be happy to share it with folks as, as this kind of next round of papers comes out, um, a really interesting survey of some different ways of thinking about even boards, right, that can actually allow for a, a deeper diversity of perspectives and for more people to understand one another, right? So, but, but the, the, the demand is to rethink what efficacy vis-a-vis -vis philanthropy is and whether the ends are um, the ones that we have been operating in or if the ends should be different ones. And what I'll end this with is to say, um, I'm not pleased with the way that Jewish philanthropy, in my opinion, seems to have been operating within the confines of this system of massive wealth inequality and seems not only to be not making a difference in it, but in fact, um, sort of creating its rules and its measurements as a validation of that system of really, in my mind, massive and unhealthy inequality. So it's a really big question mark then. Do we, do we stick with those markers and those measures? So um, I just want to say to everybody who's listening, if anybody has a question or comment, um, we have about six minutes left. And so now would be the time to just write it in on the, uh, on the chat and, uh, and I'll try to surface them as they come in. Um, we had a comment from uh, Jonathan, which, uh, which Mark referenced about, um, about consensus-based processes. Uh, and, and are they slow moving or does it prevent you from taking risks or being bold? Um, uh, just drawing from that, um, from that uh, question, is there, is there a way for Lila for, for some of these ideas to be implemented in, in part, uh, a certain percentage of a uh, foundation or federations giving being done uh, uh, along these lines or, or does, that, um, does that not do it and we need a really wholesale kind of revolutionary uh, uh, pivot? Um. So I get to, you know, sit in my little office and say, everything should change tomorrow and here are my ideas and, and whatever. But I think it's really important to know that there is a reality of institutions, of incredibly dedicated professionals, of people who are doing just really valuable work. And so to, you know, wholesale make some kind of hard turn into a really different way of measuring efficacy of doing grant making um, would be destructive. So I think that in fact, taking some small steps, thinking about designating you know, X percentage of the funds to be spent differently, to be part of a different kind of public process. I think having um, some time to do some real education about different forms of grant making, but education also about democracy and about the relationship between philanthropy and democracy. Um, you know, I think having a broader knowledge base about these issues, um, all of that I think would be really important um, because what I'm suggesting couldn't happen by fiat, right? Um, it would have to take people embracing a different paradigm. And I take great hope from the fact that you know, I finished this book and it will be out in the fall about American Jewish philanthropy. And one of the really interesting findings in, in the research that I've done um, is about when and why Jewish organizations started to be so attracted to the idea of building endowments. Um, and many people I think would think, well, you know, it just makes sense and this is what we've always done. And it's, it's just actually not true. It demanded a really self-conscious cultural shift. And, you know, a new knowledge apparatus and halfway measures and people doing all sorts of experiments. And so 
I would say the same thing that, you know, even if you, if you dip your toes into this, um, that would be, that, that's how these things begin. That's how a, a shift happens. Um, a number of comments and questions coming in about uh, um, kind of two sets of questions coming in and maybe I can get 30 seconds from you on, mm -hmm. uh, on each of these. Um, the balance between, for Jewish philanthropies, between sustaining and growing the Jewish educational, uh, um, I, I, you know, social synagogue worship, like the entire Jewish communal infrastructure versus the kind of pressing humanitarian need now or giving to kind of non-Jewish causes, non-Jewish entities, as you mentioned. Uh, how do you, uh, how does it find to be balanced between those two? Um, and then the second set uh, comment on uh, not just, not in the United States, but um, UK, Israel, this is a question from Hannah about, um, uh, about the compromising of democracy and what roles philanthropy should be playing in that. Mm -hmm. We just get 20 seconds on each and then uh, <laughs> wrap up. Those are admittedly you kind know, of larger questions, but just wanted to give you the opportunity to respond. Right, I mean, I think for the balance between like Jewish giving and, and not Jewish giving, um, and that was something I sort of tried to touch on that, again, um, you know, not to get too academic about it, and this is probably frustrating to those of you listening who are just trying to run institutions and doing just incredible, important work. Um, but we create those distinctions, right? We articulate them in particular ways and we decide, um, you know, what we think are the important Jewish institutions that are called Jewish institutions that need to be supported in various ways and what the important non-Jewish institutions are. And, and at the very least, um, to engage a broader community of um, Jewish stakeholders in those questions, right? Instead of saying that, you know, we're gonna name these three things as Jewish values and we're gonna try to get, you know, as we have more and more wealth transfers happening as the baby boomer generation is um, fading and we're gonna, you know, put all this money in this massive fund and we're gonna, try to get it to like make sure that the future understands Jewish values exactly as we understand them. Um, I, I think instead to, to have a broader kind of conversation about that and then make decisions and priorities in part based on, on that. Um, and there's so much more that, that we could say about that. And I understand it's, it's super complicated. Um, and then in terms of the demise of democracy and what philanthropy can and should do, um, I, I do think that um, the more that philanthropy can see itself as a partner for, you know, robust, publicly minded institutions, the more that philanthropy can see how important it is to protect voting rights, right? Not to tell people who to vote for, but to make sure that people are educated to understand why and how to exercise that right, right? The more that philanthropy can help fight against the incredible distrust in the government and the distrust in the media, the better. And I know I'm, I'm out of time. Yeah, we're going to have to, I'm just getting the mark that we're going to yeah. uh, turn off very, very shortly. But, um, but I just want to encourage everybody to, I, I shared the link to Lila's, um, Lila's article. So I want to pass it back to Mark for just to close off the session. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Lila, thank for you. everything. Yeah, so just my thanks to Yehuda and, and Lila and to JFN. I, I think, as you can probably tell, I'm not in complete agreement with all of Lila's recommendations or conclusions, but I think what makes JFN such an important place uh, is it allows funders um, to be challenged um, and to have their ideas and preconceptions challenged. And I think in today's day and age uh, and political environment, unless we're willing to sit around tables where really smart people are challenging our preconceptions, we're not gonna create better communities and better society. So thank you very much, uh, Lila, Yehuda, and thank you to uh, JFN for giving um, this conversation some oxygen and opportunity. Thank you.